morning. When I had two kids to feed and take care of, like there wasn't any time for crying or whining or complaining. I don't think my kids knew half the stuff that I went through raising them because of the mess. I didn't let them know that, you know, I was robbing Peter to pay Paul to make sure, you know, our lights or gas stayed on or the water stayed on. So I think they just thought I was super mom. Try to do all this stuff and make it seem effortless when I was falling apart, you know, on the inside. The answer to my prayers would be to actually be successful in life, to have reached my goals, to be able to take care of my daughter, not living check to check, being happily married, being the mother that I always wanted to be. I only know what I'm around. I'm a young mom and I go check from check. I live in the projects for right now. That's only a stepping stone for me. I keep pushing myself and my support team. Like I don't, I don't see it as property. I just see it as the beginning. A couple of things occurred in my life that sort of got me planted on the other side of poverty. And part of it is I got married. That's my mom and dad, and that's his mom and dad. And when they got married, my mom was 16. And people took a chance on me. I was cleaning houses, and I was just doing whatever I could to make money, and I had enough money. I mean, I made just enough money to pay my rent. And my, my young son, he gave me away. I think about my landlord, who, when I left, said, you know, you came to me, and you didn't have a job, and you had these two kids, and, um, and I took a chance on you and you didn't let me down. And I wonder if I were not white, if he would have taken that chance. Some days the bus doesn't even come. But it's coming, this one comes usually first. Need something to eat? Good snack. All right. Your stomach hurts and your head hurts. What up with my bus bed? It says what comes before and what comes after 16. So 14, 15, yeah. Boston supposed to be in here. 
Yes. Okay. Give me a hug. You made it for breakfast. Yes. 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 Yes.
in the nonprofit world, I didn't even have a bachelor's degree. Uh, but the company, the organization was in really dire straits, and I think uh, maybe they couldn't be as picky <laughs> as they needed to be. Anyways, it worked out really well, um, and I went back to school. I realized I didn't know anything about leadership at that time, so I went back to school. So then I felt like, you know, once I got my bachelor's degree, I had to get a master's, because there were so many people out there that thought I had one. So then I got one. But then I had to get another one, because I wanted one in education, because I wanted to know more about that. And then I wanted to walk 200 miles through Spain, and then I wanted to get a, a doctorate. And um, Greg recently said, so when you get your doctorate, are you done with school now? And I always say yes, but I know that's not true. By the way, I don't know what else I'm going to go back to school for. You can't have two PhDs. It doesn't even make any sense. Number today, 67, bathroom code on the top. Thank you. You're welcome. Sweep the peanuts off the floor, wipe tables, pushing chairs, check the trash cans. I'm wiping windows. Make sure the um, high chair seats are striped. Check the bathroom occasionally. Is everything from here to there. It's all me. Any job I have, I try to do all the responsibilities I have to the max. When the summer's over, I actually have some new plans in store. So I'm thinking about working the part-time or full-time, whatever I get offered at a school, their basketball program, girls basketball team. My little sister plays and I want to always be there to support her. So. Why not be an assistant coach? That's what I'm into. And um, someone called me up and let me know it was an opening. So I made a resume yesterday. I'm probably going to send that in into other couple learning centers. And that's what's in my mind right now. So basically, my role here at the church is to manage the finances. Hi, Deacon Donny. All of our bank accounts, payroll, accounting, and HR. I actually do some, I manage the audits. Every year we're audited. Any money that comes through, any credit card transactions, any cash checks, money orders, the 90% of the cash comes through me. Brandon. This is was all in my car from the white party. <laughs> I created instructions for every day of the week. So every day of the week I do bank reconciliations, general ledger transactions, payroll. I have instructions for everything. So if I, if I ever got hit by a bus, my job would be, they would, some, anybody would be able to do my job. I think sometimes people took my drive as uh, that I wanted to be, um, that I thought that I was better than them. So I didn't think that I was ever thought that I was better than them, but just different. And I think I desired different things. Like a lot of my friends, they got, like I got pregnant my senior year in high school. I moved out of Northview Heights altogether. So like that was like out of the norm for you, you know, you're supposed to get a, a house, a project across the court from your mom and you're supposed to, you know, I was supposed to bring that generation up in, in that same environment. And that just was never, it was never a possibility for me. Everybody be like, your mom's so nice. I'd be like, my mom is nice. I'm surprised you said that. Like, I mean, hey. But she's mean to some people. She's just straightforward. We don't BS. That's where I get that from. She's just straightforward. Everything she's going to tell you how she feel. When I was younger, I was I was good. I was good in school. As I start getting older, our relationships start changing because I start acting out. Like my, my relationship with my dad, he went back to jail. He was back and forth in jail. So it was like that affected my relationship with my mom too because because of my behavior. So I mean I'm in school now, but it was kinda like it was rocky. 
I almost ain't making it. When I was younger, all my mom had to do was give me a honey bun and I would tell break it down, break everything down. <laughs> 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 my, sister, my sister said I'll really be eating my honey but my mom what so what happened I'll be telling her yeah this happened he was here she was here they was here yeah this is what happened <laughs> <laughs> he was a young snake for the honey <laughs> bun. all she had to do is give me a honey bun I was breaking everything down he's cracking up <clears throat> Oh goodness gracious. So I'm um, second generation American. My grandparents came from Italy and I lived in a multi-generational house and my grandma lived with us. And she was a very good cook, the best cook. Although everybody thinks their Italian grandma is the very best cook. But mine really was. And you know, we didn't have a whole lot, but you could always feed people. Everybody was pretty poor. You know, people came over from another country. They didn't speak the language. So I think at that time, food was really important because we didn't have a lot, but it was always something that you could do to assure that some, you could provide people with that. And even if you didn't have a lot of money, um, my grandmother had a garden, a little teeny tiny postage stamp of a yard, but she grew everything she needed to make what we call peasant food. So let me just tell you how ridiculous we are. So this is a refrigerator that's filled with food. There's two people that live here, and one of them travels all week. This is a pantry filled with food, right? Wait, there's more. Don't, be, don't think we're done. Come on in here. This is another refrigerator filled with food. I just think it's just long-term food insecurity, you know? <laughs> and then I always have this thought in my head one second. What if somebody I know needs food? I have to have food here. What if somebody comes over to eat? I have to have food here. So. <laughs> so we're at the corner of Mayflower and Polson. This is where I grew up. That, this parking lot was once my home. We actually lived in a duplex. And um, then along Polson, there were apartments and some stores. This was my dad's house. We think about poverty, we think about parents who don't care, um, people that aren't willing to work hard. Um, and I, I can tell you that my dad worked really hard. He was a bartender. Um, he worked six days a week. He worked till three in the morning. My mom, you know, made, we made homemade, she made homemade bread and homemade pasta and sewed all of our clothes. I mean, everybody worked really hard. Why do you have those on? What? And you're going to ride your scooter? Yes. For what? You want to get jacked up? You can hear everything through the walls. There was a couple on top of us that were having, I guess, an abusive relationship where you always heard him screaming at her, putting his hands on her, and she's screaming, don't put your hands on me in front of my son. This, this stuff you don't want to hear in your own home. And another time, there's floods going on. I don't know what's going on with my neighbor, but the water actually went in our living room and got in the rug and I don't know where the water came from so I didn't want the I didn't want to keep the rug. I don't know. I don't think it's the best neighborhood for me. It's a big policeman out the door, door, door. He will grab you by the collar, make you pay a dollar. I don't wanna go to Mexico the more, more, more. Shane oh. You stay getting jacked up. You really tired? Guys, you want a little bit of juice? Huh? Sit up, so you're gonna fall asleep. Are you really hungry? No. You're not hungry? The reason I named Boston, Boston, is a um, 
based on the Boston Tea Party. Them being under debt and everything was going wrong and they just grabbing the tea and being free from it, just throwing it away in the ocean. And it was like, that's what I should name her. That's that's the story. That's I'm going to be free from everything I'm going through. It was a new beginning. It says be free. And I'm, I'll, I think I'm going to get her name at the bottom. But I've been having this tattoo in my mind for like years now. And I finally got it. When I first found out I was pregnant, I was like so in denial. Because the true story is, I was told like, oh, we couldn't, that couldn't happen. And I was young and just listening to some guy. I was actually stuck. I felt like my my whole life was going to end or nobody would, would want to worry about me or, and my thought wasn't to have Boston, to be honest. I was scared. I didn't know anything about having a child. I watched kids, but not have my own. But um, the people I was around, my support, were like, don't, don't give up, or it's not over. It's just a different beginning, or a new story is gonna be told. So I was getting dressed and ironing my clothes. And then my daughter calls me. So when I answer, she is like, your son just got arrested. I was like, shit, he goes to court tomorrow. And then I'm like, shit, again, because that means I'm about to come up out of some more money. And I felt bad for him because then he would have been another, a third case that he would have had to fight. Oh, you out here um, preoccupied? I'm about to just not about to smoke. Uh, are you coming in? You need to be high to, to talk to us? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. This is my first time seeing him. I haven't talked to him all day. So... They told me, they said, I got an open gun case. So they said they know me for playing with guns. So they said, they pulled me over. I wasn't driving, but they pulled us over, searched the car. The usual, it's what they always do. It's starting to irritate me. Because every time they see me, they pull up talk to me, try to search me, or if I'm in a car, they pull me over, search me, search the car. It's getting irritating. What's up, yeah? Do you know what this is? What is uh, your, your dad's death certificate? Mm -hmm. So his father was a junior. He wasn't. He, so that means. He would have been a third. It was only 35 days. Mm-hmm. You know what that say? It says immediate cause. No, I can't read with this. That says cerebral vascular accident due to a brain atrophy due to, that's a CH, chronic alcoholism. Yeah, I knew it. I could read that one. That's the only one I heard. I'm looking in the rear view. They turn around at the light. 
and made a U-turn. Yeah, and start following us. But the car behind us was driving super slow. <laughs> so as we, we cut, we go down the ramp and we go straight and go down California. So we go to Nunu's house. Like, and we was, we pulled over. I threw my hands out the window. I had my phone in my hand. Right. I my hands out the right. window. Nunu grabbed So they don't try to shoot you. Nunu grabbed his license, had one hand on the steering wheel, had his license out the window. They didn't. They wasn't even worried about his license. They wasn't. They didn't ask for his license mm -hmm. or registration. They didn't. Like, but this how much they was worried about us. They was worried about me so much. His new new stickers is bad. They didn't even notice that his stickers was bad. So they didn't get his registration. Nothing. No, they didn't worry about his insurance. Nothing. They was so worried about me. I'm like, man, this is ridiculous. I'm like, dog, are you serious right now? He told me, like, I'm going to find something to charge you with. He said, really, dog? Put me in handcuffs. You just, I said, I said, dog, you just want something to get me with. Mm -hmm. He said, he didn't want to find something. I said, dog, you just want something to get me with. You see my table? <laughs> this is Tyrese's hood. All this, all these nicks in the table. Them ones in my hood. I, I was gonna get a, uh, I meant to get a, a little marker, the little wood marker from Home Depot so I could do it and you wouldn't see it. Clearly you forgot all about it. I put myself in the situation so there's not really, I can't really be mad at nobody but myself. What happens, I just gotta do better from here. But they keep messing with me. <laughs> My relationship with my son has, like, gone through many phases. Um, initially, you know, Eric was like your ideal child. He did everything he was supposed to do. He was an honor student. He played basketball, loved by all his teachers. He, w If you could have a perfect child, he would probably be it. A whole bunch of things happened in, like, a two-year period. I divorced my husband, his father went to jail, he was going through puberty, and um, he was going to a new school. So it was like all these changes in this short period of time, and I think Eric really didn't know how to adjust. I told you, like, go study with friends, like, get a little, there's little study groups, have to, you could sign up for study groups, you just, your ego wouldn't let you. I never studied before. I don't know how to study. Right, but if you was with other people, they could show you how to study. You ain't want to learn. It was just a little reality check for you because you had to. I know because I got my bachelor's degree while I'm working. You you be going a little too hard for me. <laughs> no, I should have showed you that it was possible. <laughs> no, nah, he did, but I'm like. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> like, you be, you be 24 hours a day, seven days right. a week. Right, right. Work now, play later. Right, exactly. You wanted to play while you was working. <laughs> and you ain't pay no, you ain't pay no dues. <laughs> you know, we basically just waited until the judge was open to see us so he could waive his preliminary hearing. The evidence, the evidence in the case is what it is. I don't think Eric's trying to fight anything. He just wants to push it through so that he doesn't get indicted by the federal government. So now we just wait till his next court hearing on August 25th. For the first 30 years of my life, I was struggling with poverty. I was on food stamps. For a little while, I got cash assistance. I attended bar. I cleaned houses. There were times, many, many, many times, where I cooked dinner for my kids, and I waited till they were done, and whatever they didn't eat, that's what I ate. I remember you know, trying to get to the daycare center when I was a single parent, and knowing that if I didn't get there at 6 o'clock, I, they were going to charge me that 25 extra dollars. And honestly, that 25 extra dollars meant we wouldn't eat. You know, I mean, that was, that was a lot of money. And, and the traffic is heavy. 
and you're ready to kill somebody, you know, and you don't have any patience and you go to get your kids and maybe you get there at one minute to six and the door's not open and you're not as patient then for the rest of the night with your kids and you're not as patient with your neighbors and it just leads to ugliness, you know, because you're so stressed. It's a big rock on your chest. Thank you, let's go, let's go. Put them on the line. Everybody on the wall. Balls on the line! Balls on the line! You already know the rules, I'm not explaining them. Get hit in the head, you're still in. You get hit directly, you're out. You make a shot, your whole team's in. Ready, go! <laughs> Is this your book bag? No. All right. That's it. When I first started camp here, I was in second grade and so on. I just kept continuing all the way up till I was in high school. And then I became a um, crew member still in high school. And then after graduating, I became a team staff and so on. And then 2012, I um, had Boston. And that was, I was actually afraid to be at camp because I was kind of ashamed, like to, to have a baby and I'm at this Christian organization. But they actually really were supportive. Like they were like, stuff happens, Dom, and this and that and wanted me to stay in the program, and that's exactly what I did. They even threw me a baby shower and everything. So I came back. I didn't want to leave. They made me feel even more like family, and I just, I just kept coming, and I'm still here, so. Hmm. And it's so crazy because I see a lot of me and a lot of the kids, and I'm like, I understand that. Or like I try to tell them like, I've been there, I've done that. Or I'm doing it, or they're doing the same thing I used to do. So a lot of times the trouble kids I do go towards because it's, it's, they might feel more comfort, comfortable with me and that's, that's usually how it works. We first met in high school. I'll say, I was more like the quiet type of dude. She was just like the funny, goofy chick, like. <laughs> and then we just re recently re reconnected not too long, long ago, then we just clicked. If you land on that, you lose your next turn, so the next person goes twice. Mm -hmm. You go. One I more time. I right here and then I went and I... I can go back to my brother. One. Yeah. Once I two go... Two oranges. One, two. You're attacking me!
And I don't think people ask you how you're doing because they really want to know. They don't want to hear like, you, girl, well, I'm stressed out, you know, my, my gas bill need paid, you know, my son's about to go to court. They don't really want to know that. Like they, when people ask you how you're doing, they want to be like, oh, okay, I'm blessed. I think for African-American women, I think there's more of a need for us to be strong. I think part of it is we put the pressure on ourselves. And I think another part of it is, is society's view of how we should be. Or other, like, other African-Americans feel like, girl, like, don't be crying over that, over that BS. You better get yourself together and dust yourself off and keep it moving like we, we were taught to be that way. Like my son said the other day, his brother was out here like, why are your mom out here changing this light bulb? He's like, you should be changing it. He's like, she just do it herself. Like she don't ask anybody to do stuff for her. And I don't. I think I was always that person people came to and never had a person that I would come to. Didn't really have that for myself. I am an accomplished recreation coordinator whose leadership skills are creativity and I provide for effective events, management activities, and excellent student relationships. As an out-of-the-box thinker, I am capable of planning and implementing age-appropriate activities for students. Also, I am a competitive person with many years of experience in women's basketball and other athletic programs. So I just made a resume. <laughs> Finally had to update a lot of stuff that I've been doing and I'm gonna send it to a couple places. That's where I'm at and hopefully I get a call back from them. Here you go, sir. That worked out, I really appreciate it. No problem. Today is my day off. Today, I came to the family division to find out about child support, trying to um, either get my child's father involved or how that works or get money from him just to help out. She was seeing her dad in the past, but ever since he got out of whatever he was going through in the jail, went to boot camp, left that, I, I don't really see them, and she doesn't see them at all. I felt kind of scared to do the child support thing because as a young child, when I was growing up, my mom had my dad on child support, and it was, it just gave me a negative vibe. My dad was probably upset at the time about it. Now I'm going to go to the welfare office to let them know that my hours changed. Maybe I'll be um, eligible to get more food stamps. When you make more and my rent goes up, does food stamps go up or? Sometimes it does, it depends on the amount. Okay. Usually when I have to come downtown and handle these kind of things, it does take a long period of time. There's a lot of lines, a lot of waiting, but at the end it is worth it. So up north my mom was like the weed lady. So she sold marijuana on the side, which I didn't, it really wasn't embarrassing then, but I, I thought it was like kind of cool. Like everybody is coming to my house because my mom sold marijuana, except when the police came. I knew it was illegal, but uh, people, you live in the projects. Everybody did illegal stuff. People were stealing, selling bootleg stuff. You become desensitized to some stuff that may be like outrageous to other people because you grew up in that community where it's so socially acceptable. Good. 
Yeah. 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 There were several occasions where I wasn't able to afford to get my hair done professionally, but I guess I've always been like the hairdresser of my family, so I've always did my sister's and everybody else's hair, so I've always been able to do my own hair. So I think I've always had that skill and I've always had to improvise in times where I didn't have the money. I guess my view on it is like I worked pretty hard. I worked two jobs. I went to school full time. I made the necessary sacrifices. And now that I'm in a position where I can pay for myself to get my hair done every week or whenever, I deserve it. So that's what I'm going to do for myself. So when I see people from Northview, they, they see me with my blazer on or my hair done. They be like, don't act like you ain't from Northview. Like, like my, my presence and what I wear says, sends a message to them that I'm not from Northview. Because, and, so I, and I used to always say to them, like, well, what do people from Northview look like? What am I supposed to look like? I feel like sometimes I have to prove myself and I don't feel like I want to prove myself. And I don't necessarily feel like I've had made all the right decisions. I feel like God's presence in my life was the reason why I'm where I, where I am. I think people see me and think that it was easy, and it wasn't. I'm doing better with that, not making it look so easy and letting people see some of the pain. So. I make $10 an hour at Five Guys as a manager right now. I work 40 hours a week. My pay is usually around sometimes $320 a week at the least and other times like $370. Things I pay for every month are my rent right now went up, which is $371. Um, if you get hit with the late fee, you got to pay $15 extra dollars. And sometimes I do do that because I don't get paid until that next Thursday. Yes. That's the only points I got. Oh, dang. My phone bill, and it's an iPhone, and I pay $109 right now. Um, Boston is now in kindergarten that I have to pay $40 a month. I get $109 in food stamps. Other than my bus pass, that's $25 a week every Sunday. After paying all my expenses, I usually come down to $20 or less. And my mom knows I'll be hitting her up like, Mom, can I borrow, can I borrow a couple dollars just until Thursday? I think it's hard to save because I still want to enjoy myself. Like, yes, I want to work hard. Yes, I want to be this great mom. Yes, I want to be a good girlfriend. So it's like, it's hard to do all that stuff when you want to save. Um, a pork taco, a beef taco, a spicy beef taco, two vegetable tacos, and a side of black beans. Yeah, we don't know which one's the spicy beef. That looks like pork, right? That's pork. It's okay, but it looks like vegetables. That just looks like beans, so what's in here? Is there... Oh, there's meat in there. Oh, that one's meat. That looks like a beef, that looks like a plain That's beef. That's a beef. That's pork. Okay. What's that one? I thought that was pork. Oh, that's pork. I have no idea. Maybe Yeah, it's... I don't know. With our wedding money, we did something kind of practical and smart. <clears throat> we actually bought a house. Um, 
Well, we like to do things all at once. Like yeah. We were not afraid. We got afraid married. Of. We had. I like, graduated house. school, started a new job. We got married and bought a new, moved into a new house. In a new neighborhood. In a new neighborhood, all within like three weeks. Yeah. You know, through all of it, they're going to school. Um, starting off with my associates, getting my bachelor's on my MBA. I mean, for me, my parents were both college graduates. There was still always sort of this expectation um, in my mind that I'd be a college graduate, but. The first few years out of high school, um, I wasn't on that track. You know. Now, my parents always told us we were going to go to college, but I really didn't know anybody that went to college. They right. always they talked about it, but I didn't really know anybody. And then, you know, I had kids. And when was I going to do that, and how was I going to afford it, and how could I make that happen? So it really only was able to happen once, you know, sort of you were much more established in your career, and then, you know, I could I could then kind of take that track. No, I remember the conversation when um, we were still working on bachelors and it's almost thinking of giving up. And I was like, but, you know, it's going to take me 10 years and I'll be 40 years old. And it's like, well, what did I say? You're going to be 40 anyway. You're be 40 anyway. Um, right. And you can have it or not. And yeah. I didn't know you were going to uh, <laughs> become a, <laughs> get a, a second master's and then a PhD, but yeah. it's awesome. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I really didn't know anybody that went to college when I was growing up, and I didn't really know anybody that had made it. Then when we moved to the suburbs, then I had friends who had very nice homes and um, and very nice cars and more than one car and and um, the big portrait over the piano. But it really wasn't even. I don't think that that the the better opportunities and better jobs was as much about like having all kinds of things as it was. Um, making sure that we would stay that we would stay comfortable because I always have this fear that just one quick slip on the banana peel and um, I'm in no better shape than I was 30 years ago. I, I'm telling you, I look at cars and I think, oh, I have to get a car. What if I needed to sleep in that car? I, I think that as I'm buying a car doesn't make any sense at all. I know, but you know, I've been homeless and I've been really poor, and I also know that none of us are immune to tragedy. I was a young single parent. I was working really hard. I'm the same. I was the same person then as I am now. I was dedicated to my family. I was working really hard. But if I didn't have Greg or the additional income that came with being married, the additional support that came with being married, the additional support in child rearing that comes with being married, I wouldn't have been able to do half the things that I did. There were job um, opportunities that I took that I was only able to take because I had a husband at home who was really great with the kids and I could do an overnight trip and I could prove myself to my employer. It's not a matter of whether or not people work hard enough or are smart enough or try hard enough or want it badly enough. Other things kind of have to fall in place for, for it to happen. There were at least a hundred occasions where if something didn't kind of break the right way, uh, would have ended up somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And you know, fortunate. I was fortunate to meet you. Yes, you were. Absolutely. <laughs> um, fortunate to to get into that field at the time that I did, and the growth of that whole industry. I mean, I don't think I've been unemployed a single day since I was like twelve years old. I mean, I've worked continuously, and I don't. There are people that are out of work for years, and it's not their fault. And I'm just an optimist in some ways. It, like it's weird. I, I will off, like we laugh, but we go to you know fundraisers and events, and you buy fifty fifty tickets, or you do the uh, the silent auction or the, the Chinese auction, putting tickets in a bag. And I actually think I'm going to win every time. He every does. time, I, he I does. actually <laughs> I expect things to turn out well. The rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> Clock out. Let's clock out. Markayla, you ready? Yeah. Come on, Markayla. If you're getting on the same bus. It's 11.03. We just did a great close, I think. Dev did a great job training. Deja. I'm waiting on 11.15 bus, so a lot of times I get done early, got time just to grab a snack and um, get on a bus. 
and plans tomorrow, summer camp, super early. So I don't have to drop my daughter off because my mom got that covered because she kept her overnight. That's the game plan. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. You don't want to get to know anybody for no reason. Right. Over coffee. Right. Yeah, I'm that's... like, a small talk drives me nuts. All right, then. So, you're yeah. right. Uh huh. I know these things. You think? Yeah, I do. One of the major misconceptions of African American women is that we're, um, we're ghetto. We're, we're angry. I've been titled the angry black woman on many circumstances just for speaking my opinion or trying to voice my opinion. I don't like crowds. I don't like a lot of people. I, don't, I can deal with one person or a few people at a time. Oh. It's easier. Okay. I was working a, for a local sense. government agency, which I won't mention, where my boss said to me, he put me on this project, and I think he put me on the project so that he because he didn't think I was going to be able to complete it. And I completed it in, the, in, in a shorter period of time than he anticipated. And he like looked through the project, like the documents, and he was like, wow. He's like, you people really are smart. And I was like, I was like, I think I asked him at the time, I was so taken aback, like, what does that even mean? The average person, employee may come in, like, I'm going to work at an eight on a scale from one to 10, we, ha we have to work out of 15 to be seen. So it's like, it just, it impacts you in a way that affects you, the way you view yourself. All right, I'm about to roll. Call this the loop -dee. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. This is the last day for me at camp, and it was an um, activity day. Volunteers came and helped. Go back, go back. We had a um, water slide thing and games and different stuff. In the beginning of the summer, I applied for a couple other jobs. Um, trying to further my career. And one was a assistant coach for a middle school. And the other one was just helping in the after school program wherever I was needed. Kai, did you sign my shirt? The assistant job, they didn't get back to me because there's a lot of stuff going on with the beginning of the school year, but I hope to hear back from them. And the other job, my schedule is um, all over the place, and I have to find a good time to get back to them. Ethan, so much I know. See, boss. Go. This is George. You didn't even sign my shirt. To give up five guys to to do another job, I want it to be my career. I do outreach basketball every Monday, and that's like a gig I do. And it's not full time, it's just um, seasonal. And I don't want another just seasonal job. I want to get into what I, what I love to do, what I want to do in the future. So this is my church. It's a church where I was baptized, and the church where I made my first Holy Communion. And like all good Italian Catholic kids, we went to this school. And the convent, if you were a really good kid, you cleaned the convent as a reward. So we started a Facebook page, our, you know, people that went to Our Lady Hope of Christians. And everybody gets on and talks about how it's so sad that the church looks like this. And one day I kind of said to everyone, you know, it's just like anything else in your life. If you don't tend to it, it will no longer be whole. You know, we all walked away from this church and from this neighborhood. And then we sit and cry or lament that, oh, it's so sad, I think it's terrible that the church has gotten into disrepair. 
We didn't do anything to keep it from being in disrepair. We want our kids to not do some of the things that we've done, but some of the mistakes that we've made made us better people. So I feel like why would I try to save my son from himself? I want him to have his own path and have his own destiny. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to say Um, I think um, God's plan for Eric is. I guess I see him like helping other young people go through such a similar situations than that he's gone through, and maybe mentoring other young persons to not go down the path that he went down. And when I pray, those are the things that I see. And his, his personality is a lot like mine. To, and that's why I know he's gonna do whatever he wants to do because nobody could tell me what to do. Nobody. I've been thinking so much about my confidence in relation to my upbringing. And my upbringing was poverty and violence, and what that means for your confidence, it has impacted every single thing I've done. I have doubt whether or not I'm doing good enough, whether or not I can continue to do good enough. I think about myself at the corner, living at the corner of Mayflower and Paulson, and I think about myself now living at the corner of Beachwood and Forbes, and most of the time, I feel like a fraud. I feel like it's only a matter of time before people figure out, I don't know what I'm doing there. And it continues to happen it's been going on way too long. I was thinking, I'm far too old for this. <laughs> so. A lot of people don't understand the struggle. It is one thing when you have it all and you were brought up that way and you don't know. And it's another thing when you feel different about someone else because they might not have what you have and they look down upon them about it. So that, that really puts a um, pain in my heart because I work hard as I can to put food on the table for my child. I work as hard as I can to pay the bills and some, even when I don't have it, there's a lot of times I'll put others before myself. And to like know that you'll always be judged <laughs> What's fun today? The fact.